As you can see, the title of my talk is Knowledge Construction, the Canon Debate, and the Education of Citizens in Diverse Societies. Uh, I was an elementary school teacher in the Arkansas Delta, uh, elementary school student. I, I wonder what's going on because I see a Megan, but not myself in the, in my image. Is, is that okay? Yeah, we, we can see you. Um, okay, I just want to be to sure. Yeah. Okay, I want to make sure because I couldn't. Okay. Um, again, the title of my talk is Knowledge Construction, the Canon Debate in the Education of C Citizens in Diverse Societies. I was an elementary school student in the Arkansas Deltas in the 1950s. And one of my most powerful memories is the image of the happy and slaves in my social studies textbook. That, that, that's a powerful image that I, 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 I still remember very powerfully. I also remember that there were three other blacks in my textbooks, Booker T. Washington, the educator, George Washington Carver, the scientist, and Marian Anderson, the contralto. I had several persistent questions throughout my school days triggered by these uh, images. One, one was, why were the enslaved people pictured as happy? Were there other bl Blacks in history beside the two Washingtons and Anderson? Who created the image of the happy enslaved people? Why? Why were they pictured as happy? The image of the happy enslaved people was inconsistent with everything I knew about the African American descendants of enslaved people in my segregated community. We had to drink water from fountains labeled colored and we could not use the city's public library. However, we were not happy about either of these legal requirements. In fact, we resisted these laws in powerful but subtle ways each day. For example, as children, we savor the taste of white water when the authorities were preoccupied with more serious infractions against the racial caste systems. Throughout my schooling, these questions remain cogent as I tried to reconcile the representation of African Americans in textbooks with the people I knew in my family and community. I wanted to know why these images were highly divergent. My undergraduate curriculum did not answer my questions. I read one essay by a person of color during my four years in college, and it was Stranger in the Village by James Baldwin. In his powerful essay, Baldwin describes how he was treated as the other in a Swiss village. He was hurt and disappointed, not happy about his treatment. My epistemological quest to find out why the enslaved people were represented as happy in my fifth grade textbooks became a lifelong journey that continues. And the closer I think I am to the answer, the more difficult and complex both, my, both the question and the answers become. The question, why were the enslaved people represent, represented as happy has taken different forms in various periods of my life. I have lived with these questions all of my professional life. I now believe that the biographical journeys of researchers greatly influence their values, their research questions, and the knowledge they construct. The knowledge they construct mirrors their life experiences and values. The happy slaves in my school textbooks were invented by the Southern historian Ulrich Phillips. The images of enslaved people he constructed reflected his belief 
and the inferiority of African Americans and his socialization in Georgia near the turn of the century. What about the values of researchers? Social sciences are human beings who have both minds and hearts. However, the minds and products of their minds have dominated research discourse in history in the social sciences. The hearts of social sciences exercise a cogent influence on research findings, questions, concepts, and theories. I'm using heart as a metaphor for values, which are the beliefs, commitments, and generalized principles to which social sciences have strong attachments and commitments. The value dimensions of social science research was largely muted and silenced in the academic community and, with, and within the popular culture until the neutrality of the social sciences was strongly challenged by postmodern women's studies in, in the ethnic studies movement of the 1960s and 1970s. Social science research has historically and still supported educational policies that affect, affect the life chances and educational opportunities of students. The educational policies supported by mainstream social science and educational researchers have often harmed low-income students and students of color. However, the values of social sciences are complex within diverse nations such as the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Social science and educational research over time and often within the same period have both reinforced inequality and a supported liberation and human betterment. It's done both. It's been, a, it's been complex. Sometimes social science research is liberating and sometimes it contributes to inequality. In a previous publication, I described research that supports these four assumptions that you'll see on the screen. The first one is that the cultural communities in which individuals socialize are also epist epistemological communities that have shared beliefs, perspectives, and knowledge. In the next slide, you'll see another key assumption that social science and historical research are influenced in complex ways by the life experiences, values, and personal biographies of researchers. The third assumption is that the knowledge created by social scientists historians and public intellectuals reflect and, and perpetuate their epistemological communities, experiences, goals, and interests. In the next assumption, we see that how individual social scientists interpret their cultural experiences is mediated by the interaction of a complex set of status variables, such as gender, social class, age, sexual orientation, political affiliation, religion, and region. We can come up, we can take the slides down now. I won't need them for a while. In nations around the world, the assimilationist ideology has been the dominant historical force since the age of colonization and the expansion of Western nations in the Americas, the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, and Australia. The simulation ideology maintains that in order to construct a cohesive nation in civic culture, individuals from diverse racial, ethnic, cultural, linguistic, and religious groups must surrender their home and community cultures and acquire those of the dominant 
in mainstream groups. Assimilation, assimilationists believe that ethnic attack, attachments present individuals from developing commitments and allegiance to the national civic culture. The assimilationist ideology has been dominant in American society since the turn of the century. However, it was seriously challenged by the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the 1970s, and the 1980s. It is also being seriously challenged today by the, by the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to next describe the, de the debate between the assimilationists and the multiculturalists and indicate the assumptions that each of these groups uh, assume, make and, the, and, and their epistemological positions. Assimilation claim that multiculturalism is detrimental to the nation state and to the civic community. Multiculturalists maintain that civic equality, recognition, and structural inclusion are essential for citizens from diverse groups to acquire allegiance to the nation state and to become effective participants in the civic community. Diversity assimilations also argue, diverse groups, they argue, also need to attain structural inclusion into their nation states so that they will not experience what I call failed citizenship. The claims of both the assimilationists and the multiculturalists each reflects values, ideologies, political positions, and human interests. Each position also implies the kind of knowledge that should be taught in the school, college, and university curriculum. I will describe a type of a typology that reveals the types of knowledge that have been constructed by assimilationists and multiculturalists and, the, and that reflect their values, assumption, perspectives, and ideological positions. Now, what kind of knowledge should teachers teach? I believe that teachers should help to understand all types of knowledge, both the knowledge generated by assimilationists as well as the knowledge generated by multiculturalists. Students should also participate in the debates about the way knowledge is constructed. Also the debates about conflicting interpretations, such as the extent to which Egypt influenced Greek civilization. Students should also be taught how to construct their own interpretations of the past and the present, as well as how to identify their own positions, interests, ideologies, and assumptions. What I'm arguing is that students should not only understand the assumptions made by social scientists who are multiculturalists, as well as social scientists who are simulations, but they should also construct their own knowledge, understand their own positions and their own is issues, and understand how their ideologies, their cultural experience, influence the knowledge that they construct. So that, that is really important that in order to become critical thinkers, students need to understand not only the knowledge constructed by others, but also the knowledge that they construct. They should be, students should become critical thinkers who have the knowledge, skills, and commitments needed to participate in democratic action to help their nation and the world eliminate racism, sexism, and other negative ideologies. Multicultural education <clears throat> is an education for functioning, <clears throat> excuse me, effectively in a pluralistic society. Helping students to develop the knowledge, skills, and attitudes needed to participate in reflective civic action is one of the major goals of a transformative civic ed education curriculum. The philosophical position that underlies 
my presentation today is within the transformative tradition in ethnic studies in multicultural education. This position links knowledge, social commitment and action, a transformative action-oriented education can best be implemented when students examine different types of knowledge, freely examine their perspectives and moral commitments and experience democracy in schools and in public sites such as museums, theaters, and historical monuments. How do I define knowledge? What are the characteristics of knowledge? I define knowledge as the way an individual explains or interpret reality. I conceptualize knowledge broadly and use it the way it is used in the sociology of knowledge, which includes ideas, values, and interpretations. That's how it's used in the sociology of knowledge literature. It's a wide conception of knowledge that includes ideas, values, and interpretation. As postmodern theories have pointed out, knowledge is socially constructed and reflects human interests, values, and action. Although many complex factors influence the knowledge that is created by an individual or, or group, including the actuality of what occurred and the interaction that knowledge construction constructors have with other people. The knowledge that people create is heavily influenced by their interpretations of their experiences and their positions within particular social, economic, and political systems and structures of society. In other words, knowledge, one of the one of the factors that influence the kind of knowledge that a social scientist or historians construct is their own experience within society. In the Western empirical tradition, the ideal within each academic discipline is the formulation of knowledge without the influence of the researcher's personal or cultural characteristics. However, as critical and postmodern theorists have pointed out, personal and social factors influence the formulation of knowledge, even when objective knowledge is the ideal within a discipline. What about positionality? Positionality is a concept that emerged out of feminist scholarship that describes how important aspects of identity, such as gender, race, social class, age, religion, and sexual orientation influence the knowledge that scholars construct. Positionality reveals the importance of identifying the position and frames of reference from which scholars and writers present their, their data, interpretations, and analysis. The need for researchers and scholars to, to identify their ideological positions and the normative assumptions in their work is an important part of feminist and ethnic studies scholarship, which contrasts with the empirical paradigm that has dominated Western science. The assumption within the Western empirical paradigm is that the knowledge produced within it is neutral and objective, and that its principles are universal. The effectives of values, frames of reference, and the normative positions of researchers and scholars are inf infrequently discussed within the traditional empirical paradigm that has dominated scholarship and teaching in colleges and universities in the West since the early 20th century. I'm going to present a knowledge typology in just a, a few minutes. And in this typology, each of the types of knowledge in this topology that I will describe reflects specific purposes, perspectives, experiences, goals, and human interests. Teaching different types of knowledge 
can help students to better understand the perspective of diverse racial, ethnic, and cultural groups, as well as to develop their own versions and interpretations of events and issues. Different types of knowledge also help students to gain more co comprehensive and accurate conceptions of reality. Multiple perspectives and different types of knowledge enable students to construct knowledge that is closer approximation to the actuality of what occurred than single perspectives. In an important and influential essay, the sociologist Mark Robert Murden maintained that the perspective of both insiders and outsiders are needed to enable social scientists to gain a comprehensive view of social reality. In the next slide, you will see five types of knowledge that I have conceptualized and will discuss in some detail. As you can see in these five types of knowledge are personal cultural knowledge, popular knowledge, mainstream academic knowledge, transformative knowledge and pedagogical knowledge. And I will discuss each of these no types of knowledge in turn, starting with personal and cultural knowledge, which is in the next slide. Personal and cultural knowledge are the concepts, explanations and interpretation that students derive from their personal experiences in their homes, families and community cultures. <clears throat> One of the, <clears throat> what historically has been the case is that schools have made very little use of the personal and cultural knowledge of students. Sometimes the knowledge that students bring from their cultural communities and from their families conflict with the knowledge in the schools. Research in theory by Fordham and Ogbu indicate that low-income African-American students often experience academic difficulties in schools because of the ways that their cultural and family knowledge conflict with the pedagogical knowledge within the school norms. Historically, schools have made little use of the cultural knowledge of students, particularly students from uh, marginalized communities and students of color. Their traditionally, their knowledge has been marginalized within schools and the knowledge within the school has been Anglo-centric dominant. So the challenge for teachers is how can we use, make use of student knowledge in instruction, but also how do we help students get beyond their personal and cultural and family knowledge to learn other types of knowledge. Uh, but in the next slide, uh, I talk about popular knowledge. And popular knowledge consists of the facts, interpretations, and beliefs that are institutionalized within television, movies, videos, DVDs, and other forms of mass media. And many of the Tenets of popular knowledge are conveyed in subtle rather than explicit ways. These are some of the statements that make up popular knowledge in our, in our mass media. For example, the notion that the United States is a powerful nation with unlimited opportunities for individuals who are willing to take advantage of them. Another popular notion in popular knowledge is that to succeed in the United States, only all the individual has to do is to work hard. That's one of the, the myths that we see in popular knowledge. Another one is that if you work hard and pull yourself up, up by the bootstrap, you can achieve unlimited goals. Another notion we see in popular knowledge is that as a land of opportunity for all, the United States is a highly cohesive nation whose ideas of equality and freedom are shared by all. And many of these popular knowledge notions are really myths and misconceptions about the nature of society. 
In his engage in an informative book, Lies Across America, what our his, historic sites get wrong, James Loing describes how historical sites in the United States perpetuate and reinforce popular myths about American heroes, events, and, ex and American exceptionalism. Commercial films often reflect and perpetuate popular knowledge in American society. In the next slide, I describe mainstream academic knowledge. And these are the facts, concepts, explanations and interpretation that constitute Western-centric knowledge in history and the behavioral sciences. An important tenet within mainstream academic knowledge is that there is a set of objective truths that can be verified through rigorous and objective research procedures that are uninfluenced by human interests, values, and perspectives. And this, of course, contrasts with transformative knowledge that I'll get to later. Transformative knowledge talks about how human interests influence this knowledge. In the mainstream academic paradigm, the assumption is made that there's a body of objective truth that make up, that should make up the core of the school and universe curriculum. And that much of this objective knowledge originated in the West, but is considered universal in nature and application. Mainstream academic knowledge is the knowledge that the critics of multicultural education, such as Hirsch, and Ravitch and Finn, who claim that this mainstream, mainstream academic knowledge is threatened by the addition of content about women and ethnic groups of color to the school, college, and university curriculum. This knowledge, they argue, is the Western canon and that it should be the main kind of knowledge in the curriculum. Mainstream academic knowledge, like all the other forms of knowledge that I've discussed in this lecture, is not static, but is dynamic, complex, and changing. Challenges to the dominant canon and paradigms within mainstream academic knowledge comes from both within and without. For example, we can examine the treatment of slavery within the mainstream academic community over time are the treatment of American Indians to identify ways that mainstream knowledge, academic knowledge has changed in important ways since the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For example, Ulrich Phillips' influential book, American Negro Slavery, which was published in 1918, it dominated the ways that black history was interpreted until his views were seriously challenged by researchers, other historians in the 1950s. Phillips was a respected authority on the antebellum South and on slavery. His book, which became a historical classic, is essentially an apology for Southern slave owners. A new paradigm about slavery was developed in the 19. 70s that drew heavily upon the view of slaves themselves on their own experiences. And Blassingame and Gutman were two of the historians who illuminated the perspectives of enslaved people themselves on their own experiences. In the next slide, we see transformative academic knowledge. Transformative academic knowledge consists of concepts, paradigms, themes, and explanations that challenge mainstream academic knowledge and that expand the historical and literary canon. Transformative academic knowledge challenges some of the key assumptions that mainstream scholars make about the nature of knowledge. Transformative and mainstream academic knowledge are based on different epistemological assumptions 
about the nature of knowledge, about the influence of human interests and values on knowledge construction, and about the purpose of knowledge. Transformative academic scholars assume that knowledge is not neutral, but is influenced by human interests, that all knowledge reflects the power and social relationships within society, and that an important purpose of knowledge construction is to help people improve society. Knowledge and its constructions are linked to action and to the improvement of society to make it more just and humane. These statements reflect some of the significant ideas and concepts in transformative academic knowledge. Columbus did not discover America. The Indians had been living in the, the Americas for about 40,000 years when the European, uh, Europeans arrived. Concepts such as the European discovery of America and the westward movement need to be reconceptualized and rethought from the perspectives of different cultural and ethnic groups. The, the Lakota Sioux did not view their homeland as a West as the West, rather they saw it as the center of the universe. Let's think about a concept such as the Westward movement when we rethink it in a transformative way. Again, the Lakota Sioux did not see their homeland as the West, but rather as the center of the universe. What about the Alaskans? The West, what we call the Westward movement, the West, it was not the West to the Alaskans, it was South. It was not the West to the Mexicans, it was North. It was not the West to the Japanese, it was East. And it was North for the Mexican. And it symbolized the loss of, of nearly a third of their territory and 80,000 of their citizens in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, who were, became citizens in a foreign land. So I think we need to re really help our students rethink notions like the Westwood movement. Our nation has not been characterized by harmonious relationship. Rather, the nation's history has been characterized by a cyclic quest for democracy and by struggle, conflict, violence, and exclusion, as well as the attempt to bring about equality and justice. A major challenge for the US today is how to make our, its, our ideals, our democratic ideals, a reality for all citizens. In the next slide, I describe pedagogical knowledge. Pedagogical knowledge consists of the facts, concepts, and generalizations presented in textbooks, teacher's guides, and other forms of media designed for instruction. Pedagogical knowledge also consists of the mediation and interpretation of the information and in instructional materials and resources. The textbook is the main source of pedagogical knowledge in, in, in schools in the United States. Studies of textbooks indicate that these are some of the major themes in pedagogical knowledge in the US. American founding fathers, such as Washington and Jefferson, were highly moral, liberally loving men who championed equality and justice for all Americans. The United States is a nation with justice, liberty, and freedom for all. Social class divisions are not significant issues in the United States. There are few significant gender, class, or racial divisions within the United States society. And groups of color and whites usually interact positively in the United States. These are some images that we often get from a study of textbooks. We need to implement, and this is the final part of my talk, we need to implement what I call 
transformative civic education. In transformative civic education, which is rooted in transformative academic knowledge, transformative civic education enables students to acquire the knowledge, skills, and values needed to challenge inequality within their community, nation, and the world, and to take action to create just and democratic multicultural communities and societies. Transformative civic education helps students to develop decision-making and social action skills that are needed to identify problems in society, acquire knowledge related to them, identify and clarify their values, and to take thoughtful action to make their communities and nations more democratic and just. Transformative Civic education helps students to acquire the knowledge and skills needed to know, to care, and to act to make their communities in their nation more just and democratic. It also fosters equality in the recognition of students from diverse groups. It gives students from diverse groups recognition and voice students can see themselves in a transformative civic, civic education. They can see themselves reflected in the curriculum. They can see their values reflected. They're given voice and recognition in the transformative civic education curriculum. The protests and marches that took place in the United States and in a nation around the world after George Floyd was killed by the police and on, in Minneapolis on May 25th, 2020, evoked memories of this poem by the African-American poet Langston Hughes. The marginalization and identity quest by racial, ethnic, cultural, language, and religious groups around the world are a dream deferred, writes Hughes, in this powerful poem, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a surf, surfy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Banks, very much for your talk. If we could unmute and uh, some applause. Mm -hmm. Yay, thank Yay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> for all of you. We appreciate your thought provoking comments and really have challenged us to think differently about knowledge and its construction and the way it influences much, much in all of what we do. We're going to open it up now for um, questions from our audience for Dr. Banks. Um, we have a lot of people saying thank you in the chat, but if you have a question and you can post it there. We have a question from, ah, we have a question and maybe it's a statement. It's a statement and it's okay. kind of a comment that your lecture made me think about. Yeah. Let's hear the comments. Well, it seems to me that the construction of knowledge is not so much the answers, but the questions we choose to ask. But that certainly is an important part of all the questions are uh, defines the territory. And the questions right. are really important. And, and it helps to shape, of course, what the answer is. Right. And what so, we find. Exactly. Because people are people like finding things that confirm our already what we already think we know too so how how would transformative knowledge overcome that kind of confirmation bias you have any well well i think the the really point the critical point i think about teaching about knowledge construction is to help students to understand the the multiple perspectives 
that exist on issues. For example, if you look at slavery, going back to the happy enslaved people, it didn't make sense to me that they were happy because the black folks I knew in my community weren't happy. So I said, why, how, why would the slaves be, enslaved people be happy if the black folks I know experiencing uh, structures of discrimination are not happy? I think, I'm not sure, I guess what I'm arguing that we don't necessarily overcome our biases, but we d learn about di knowledge from different constructions who help us give insight and to uh, help us understand the biases that we have. The people who wrote about the happy slave needed to see those points of view juxtaposed by, if they had asked the enslaved people, were they happy? I think that would have helped inform their points of view. I guess what I'm trying to say, maybe it's not clear, that the multiple perspectives is what will enrich our realities. Right. So that we need the multiple perspective. They will, what I'm arguing, perspectives tend to be, uh, I don't like the word bias, but they certainly reflect particular points of view. And so we need the multiple perspective, as Merton said, to get a total view of social reality. Right, right. Thank you. We have one other question from Andy DeRoyne. Um, how do we make a shift from prioritizing mainstream academic knowledge to transformative academic knowledge when there's a resistance from power holders and administrators? Well, there's always a resistance. I think that life is resistance. Um, I And I think that we, um, have to um, resist, but resist in ways that are thoughtful, that are academic, and that, pre that present different views of reality, that, that it's always a struggle to present a different view of reality. But I think as we begin, the resistance become less as more different points of view are put out there. And I don't think that legitimate points of view can infinitely be resisted as long as we document them, we research, so that we, I guess my answer is, we keep putting out multiple perspectives along with the mainstream perspectives and show how they will enrich the mainstream. If we, we can't, we will always teach about Columbus arrival in the Americas. That is fine. We leave that. So I guess what I'm getting to an answer is we still teach mainstream perspectives, but we add perspective that problematize them. We talk about Columbus landing in America, but we also talk about the native people who were there when he arrived, that we juxtapose one with the other it's not about eliminating the mainstream perspective. It's about adding to it, adding multiple perspectives. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think one way to overcome the resistance is for people to understand it's not a zero sum game. It's not one form of knowledge or the other, but it's bringing multiple perspectives on reality. Does that make sense? Thank you. I have another question um, from Jamie Giuseppe. How important is the local perspective in the development of curriculum and instruction materials? Your well, I think it, yeah, I think it's very important. I think the local perspectives is, it's, uh, it's very important. And I think what I have students do in my ethnic studies class, I have students do a family study, a history of their own family. I don't know, some of you probably watch Henry Louis Gates uh, every Tuesday night on Roots. What I have my students do in my teacher ed program is each student, many of these are white students. In fact, most of them were are, are white students. I have them do studies of their own families and they are really surprised because when they in, enrolled in my ethnic studies class, they thought, oh, I'm only gonna learn about blacks and Latinx people and American Indians and so forth. But the first assignment is 
about their own family history, which they found illuminating. So I think local history, local insights are incredibly important because we all start out local. And, 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 but I think we need to juxtapose the local with the national and with the global. And I think we need to interrelate those perspectives. But I think the local is very important and for kids to see themselves in the curriculum, see themselves uh, reflected in the curriculum and the local experience of people is one way to do that. I have another question um, from Palestine. She wants to know what is the role of schooling and should schools present all forms of knowledge or mostly introduce transformative knowledge? Well, I think uh, tr the transformative model itself is enables you to look at the different perspectives so that when you look at mainstream, I think kids should look at the mainstream knowledge because it's in the textbook. They should look at popular knowledge, but the, the key of a component of transformative knowledge is that it juxtaposes these various types of knowledge and gives alternatives. So I think in teaching transformative knowledge, we would cover the other types, if that makes sense. We would look at uh, Columbus perspectives, Abraham Lincoln, his notion of He's a very, Lincoln is very controversial in terms of his position on slavery uh, among the black, within the black community at least. So looking at mainstream perspectives of Lincoln, looking at different, let's say Lerone Bennett's perspective on, he was the ed editor at Ebony Magazine, his perspective on Lincoln, he had a very different perspective on Lincoln than mainstream perspective. And so that transformative knowledge would bring in mainstream perspectives, if that makes sense. It would be looking at different kinds of perspectives from a kind of transformative point of view. So I have another question from Megan Manfra. She says, your definition of transformative citizenship education, of course, goes beyond legal definitions of citizenship to provide opportunities for students to take action. How can teachers encourage this perspective on citizenship through what you describe as pedagogical knowledge? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad that um, she, she made, noted that the, the kind of education I'm talking about isn't just for citizens. In my latest writing, for example, I use the word civic education rather than citizenship education because I'm really concerned about the students in our school who are not legal citizens. But I think uh, we can implement civic education through action by having students participate in action even within the school. So an example would be to, students may do a survey of the literature books that are read. And if they're not books on Asian Americans or Mexican Americans make a list of books that, that, that could be ordered from the school library and present that to the principal. Make a, see what's going on in, in, in Black History Week. And if things are not going on, make a suggestion to the school and to the principal. So the actions can be within the school themselves. Uh, action doesn't, have, it can be marching in the streets, but it doesn't have to be. There are all kinds of action that can take place. For example, if the students have noticed on the playground that some students are using negative language to refer, refer to uh, Latinx kids, black kids, they could take action to go to the teacher, make a list of negative terms that are being used by kids and say, we'd like to take action to help stop this kind of behavior. So the action can be, it doesn't have to be big political action, but it can be action within the school that changes, that makes changes. Thank you. 
Um, Carl Young has a question. He was wondering if you had any insights on your thoughts about the previous administration's attempt to ban critical race theory and other social justice initiatives and even introduce, impose patriotic US history. Well, I have more thoughts about the last administration that I don't think the Dean wants me to give. So I will, I will keep most of my thoughts about the last administration. We have private. already processed the honorarium, I believe, sir. Yeah. But, so, but uh, what I think, I think a more important factor than discussing the last administration is to discuss what it means when uh, we get racism, sexism, homophobic attitudes, when we, when those things become institutionalized and sanctioned, how they come out of the, become public. For example, in one of my books, one of the authors talk about racism in the backstage and racism in the front stage. I think when you have racism within the society and you make, make it clear to people that it, it is not sanctioned, it tends to stay in the backstage. But when you get leaders who sanction bringing sexism and racism to the front stage, it comes out. So that what, so that what I think is so important for us to do as leaders, as teachers, is to make sure that we make it very clear that we do not sanction racist language, racist references, sexist language, sexist references, because what we know from all court, some of those research on the nature of prejudice, if you allow it to be stated, guess what happens? People, if they can state it, then it can become behavior. And then it can, as it did in Germany, leads to very negative consequences. So that what, I, what I'm trying to say is we should not sanction racism and sexism and other kind of negative ideologies. Because if we do, they, they are always there in the backstage. Uh, they will come to the front stage. So we, we should have strong sanctions in the schools in the community for against expressing racism and sexism in any form. Because once we give it sanction, it will come out. I think I have just two last questions. Um, this one is about misinformation, especially online, social media, and how it might impact your typology of knowledge that you presented. Yeah, the misinformation, alternative facts, and that whole uh, would be a, I put it under popular knowledge. That kind of, uh, and, and so that comes out so often on social media, um, just total fiction. I think that what we have to do in schools to really bulk up against that kind of alternative facts and, uh, it's a serious issue that we really have to teach kids that something exists, that there are facts, that people may interpret them differently. And that's so the interpretation of the facts differently. But I'm looking out my study, for example, and I see a rhododendron plant. That plant is there. In fact, we, it is there. Some people may look at it and call it an oak tree. Or what but the fact is that the rhododendron is right out front of my, my study. Uh, so that we need to help kids understand that there are some things that are factual. We may interpret the facts differently. We may see them differently, but there are certain things that exist in reality, even though they may have alternative interpretations, but th that facts do exist. And I, th I really think that we have to push very hard on the notion there are facts that can be established through observation if we use a scientific method we, of trying to verify those facts. And I think that we should be uncompromising 
in schools about factual knowledge as the base for our work and our teaching. I have a question from Dean Danowitz. Would you please talk about your approach as a dissertation supervisor and how you support and challenge students to come to their own way of knowing and doing their first major scholarly work? Well, I think there, I, well, all of you can see from the lecture I gave this afternoon that I think you're, when I'm advising students, I think their project has to come out of their heart and their lives. And if it doesn't, they won't have a stick to it. As you can see, my dissertation was on blacks and textbooks that came out of the happy slaves. So that I think it has, I advise them to choose a topic that they really care about. Choose a topic that so very important in their lives. And by the way, it wasn't easy when I came along to do that. Uh, one of the, uh, my advisor, I was very fortunate, let me study about blacks in textbook. That was not easy in those times. This was uh, 1965 and blacks, there were no courses in black studies at Michigan State at the time, for example. But I think what I encourage students to do is to choose a topic that they care deeply about choose a topic that's important to them and pursue it with all their heart and mind. Because I think unless our heart is involved in what we do, it won't be the best. And I think I've been able to stay in my work for five decades because I had a strong commitment to equality, to social justice and a personal commitment to these issues. And that's what I advise students to take something of which they feel strongly, in which they have a strong personal and value commitment. Very good. And I have a question from Henry Johnson. Um, he says, your work informs how we view knowledge construction. How can we do better in eliminating the tendency to ignore information that does not comport with our paradigm and biases? Well, yeah, that's, that's a real problem in US society, a problem I worry about a lot. For example, there are some of us who watch Fox News and some of us who watch MSNBC. And, it, 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 and when I grew up, everybody watched NBC at the time or CBS, but it's, it's a real problem and, and it's a difficult problem. And I'm not sure I have any answer except what I do, I try to, exemplify, I try to watch, I try to watch a little Fox, I don't succeed very well. And I watch in MSNBC and I watch PBS, I find, I think PBS is the best mix. It gives you, I try to find something, I don't like, I read editorials in the New York Times every day. So when I want an editorial, I go to the editorial page, but I don't want my news to be an editorial. So I think that what we need to teach kids, and I don't know, this is, you put your finger on an incredible problem in American society, of this division of where people go to get their knowledge from a source and they don't listen to the other source. I think we should encourage our students to listen to a variety of voices. Uh, and that is how we learn. I mean, I learn when I read people I don't totally agree with. And I learn when I read from thoughtful conservatives. There are some that are too extreme, but I do try to read the thoughtful ones. And I learn, I think we learn from people we don't agree with, as long as it's a thoughtful uh, conception. So I think we need to encourage our students to seek out views that don't just reinforce their view, viewpoint. And I try to do that in my own life um, I read Nathan Glazer and Nat and I was were, were colleagues and he was a anti multiculturalist but we talked and we 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 were colleagues uh, we lost Nate Nate, Nate Glazer uh, a, a year ago but I try I have friends who are conservatives and I talk to them and they talk to me and I think that's how we learn and grow 
We don't learn and grow if I only talk to multiculturalists. I think we, we need to exemplify that in our own lives. But it is a serious problem where people don't listen to the points of view with which they don't agree. It's a serious problem that we need to work on.